And that is why we're here today to glorify the name of God and all that we've done, the prayers that we've prayed, the, the songs that we have sang, and then the preaching service today hopefully will be glorifying and honoring to God. Um, this morning I want to talk to you about fig leaves and hiding places. Fig leaves and hiding places. And I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. And I want to read to you from verse uh, 25. Speaking of uh, the man and his wife, of Adam and Eve, the Bible says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And here stands the only two humans on the earth at this time, and they are standing before each other openly, and there's no corruption, there's no defilement, there's no sense of guilt, there's no sense of shame. Um, you know, there's, there's, they're, they're there with each other and before God. That's important. They're there with each other and before God, and there is no shame whatsoever in their minds. And as you read this verse at the end of chapter 2, the Bible is foreshadowing that something's going to change. You know, in novels or in writings, authors will, uh, or storytellers, they will, they'll kind of give you a little hint in advance that something in the story is about to change or take place, right? We call it foreshadowing. Um, I don't know if any, do any of you watch Dateline? <laughs> Some people have raised their hand. Carrie, my dear wife, she, 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 we haven't watched it in, in a while, but, um, when we started dating, got married, I'd never watched Dateline, and she loved Dateline. And uh, we'd watch it almost every Friday night. And um, I found out that Dateline's a lot like Hallmark movies. It's the same plot, just a different episode. You know, you've seen the Hallmark movies, the Christmas movies. There's the big city girl that comes back to the small town, and she ends up having to save the parade or whatever. And it turns out that her boyfriend from high school was in charge of the parade, and then they fall in love. Y'all seen that? If you've seen one, you've seen them all. But Dateline's the same. Somebody died and the spouse killed them. It's the same. <laughs> Every Dateline's the exact same. But one thing they do a good job of is in that first segment, they're going to foreshadow what happened. And Keith Morrison, he's got the best voice in the world, probably. He'll say something like, um, it was a beautiful family in a picturesque town and a loving father and a beautiful mother. Nothing could happen on Mayberry Lane. <laughs> and then somebody's dead when they come back from commercial, right? He's foreshadowing that something's about to happen. Something's about to go down. And here in verse 25, we have Adam and Eve in the presence of each other and in the presence of God. And I want to reemphasize that. They're in, that's important. They're in the presence of God and there is zero shame. Think about that. There's no confusion. I'll put it this way. There was no blushing in the garden before the fall. You ever been ashamed of something you did or maybe you, somebody finds out there's something that you've done or something embarrassing happens to you and you begin to blush and feel shame? There was none of that with Adam and Eve. Uh, I wrote this down. This was from John Gill, Baptist minister from the 1600s. He said they were not ashamed. And I want you to listen to this. Having nothing in them or on them or about them that caused shame. Nothing sinful, defective, scandalous, or blameworthy. No sin in their nature, no guilt on their consciences, or wickedness in their hands or actions. Albert Barnes, who's a Presbyterian minister, or was, he commented, shame implies a sense of guilt which they did not have, and an exposedness to the searching eye of a condemning judge from which they were equally free. Yet in this verse, the Bible, the Holy Spirit, is foreshadowing that something is soon to change. The entire situation is going to change. And really, human history will change. Um, you could put it in these words, that, that the death of innocence was imminent. Something was about to change. Because you get to chapter 3 and we read about the fall and it says, I won't spend a lot of time on, on chapter 3 on these first verses. There's a lot we could look at, but he says, the Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. 
And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Verse 6 says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And it says in verse 7, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They had been exposed. Then it says, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves. Listen to that. They sewed fig leaves and then they hid themselves from the presence of God. Just a few verses earlier, they were they were not ashamed. They were unashamed. They were in the presence of God and they felt no guilt. And something has transpired spired here and now they sow fig leaves together and they hide themselves from the presence of God amongst the trees of the garden. They take the things that God has created and they try to hide their shame and they try to hide themselves from an omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God <laughs> because they felt that shame. And what we saw at the end of chapter 2 is no longer there because now they're sinful and now the, the, the human race is defective. It'll be scandal plagued for the rest of human history. We're all going to be blameworthy. We're all going to have a guilt of, of consciousness. Uh, unlike what, what, what Gil said earlier, they're, now they're going to have wickedness in their hands and all about them. And now they're exposed to the searching eye of a condemning judge and they are not free, they are guilty. And, and in other ways, you could say, kind of going back to that foreshadowing, now they have to deal with their shame. Now they have to deal with their shame. They're guilty, they're sinful, they're in the presence of God. And, and there was a death that took place. God had warned them, the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Years would pass and they would physically die. But there was a death to their fellowship with God. And the thing that really separated them from their fellowship and that intimate relationship of being in the presence of God and yet feeling no shame was over. Shame had separated them from the intimate relationship that they once had with each other, but more importantly, with God. And listen to their solution. Once again, they sow fig leaves together and they try to hide themselves from God. Um, and, and I believe if there's anything in the Bible that represents for us man trying to work his way or merit his way into favor with God to deal with his shame, it is this. Fig leaves and hiding among the trees that the Creator, hiding from the Creator in the midst of His creation. Y'all think you're going to get away with it? <laughs> no. They couldn't cover their sin with the leaves and they couldn't hide from their God in the trees. And He comes to them. And so, what I want to speak to you about this morning is, is salvation, not in the ultimate sense really, salvation to heaven, eternal salvation. But I want to talk about salvation in the sense of a deliverance from your guilt and shame. Because a lot of us deal with guilt and shame. A lot of the things that keep God, that keep people from God, from having an intimate relationship with God, although we can't get back to that full fellowship on this side of heaven like they had in Genesis 2, we can get close. But a lot of the times we're kept from that relationship because we feel like we're not enough. Right? We feel this guilt. We feel this shame. And if we're ever going to feel truly right with God, 
um, you're going to have to understand that salvation, whether it's to heaven or whether it's deliverance from your guilt and shame, cannot be accomplished by your own actions. There is nothing you can do. Salvation, in any sense, was <coughs> salvation was was is it? Well, first of all, it's by grace alone, through Christ alone. Do y'all agree with that? <laughs> to the glory of God alone. It was grace that planned it, but it was Christ that secured it, and it's all for His glory. That is salvation. And and until you submit to that fact. It doesn't matter how many times you've read the Bible, how many times you've showed up to church, how many times you pray, how much charitable giving you give. None of that is ever going to make you feel right with God. None of that. You can, you can, you can, you can have the uh, perfect attendance award <laughs> at the church. You can give the most to the church at the offering plate. You can, you know, you can... You can do it all for the church and all for those in need. But at the end of the day, if you're honest with yourself and you look back on your thoughts and your actions, you will know that I do not measure up to the standard that God has set. In all of your actions, until you submit to the fact that it is all of God, you will never experience true deliverance from the shame that they are feeling in this moment. Um, I want to... I'm going to turn with you to Romans chapter 10. Now, last week we looked at Romans chapter 8. And in Romans chapter 8, it was very clear that all that God foreknew before the world began will be glorified when Christ comes back. He's not going to lose it. Y'all remember that? How many will God lose? How, what can separate you from the love of God? What did we determine from Romans 8? Nothing. Not even you can separate you from the love of God. Jesus said, no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand, including yourself, right? And so when we get to Romans chapter 10, it's important to remember that because Paul is going to say, uh, really, it's this heartfelt prayer. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, now a, a way that we unlock the scriptures to understand the Bible is you have to ask yourself, anytime you see salvation at all mentioned in the Bible, you have to ask yourself, saved from what? To understand the context or what kind of salvation is taking place. When the angel came to, to Joseph and said, Matthew 1, that she shall have a son, you shall call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. He's talking about eternal salvation, saving his people from their sins. When Peter says on the day of Pentecost, save yourselves from this untoward generation, he's not talking about saving yourself to heaven. He's talking about saving yourself from an untoward generation, from a perverse group of people who try to influence you and ruin your life. <laughs> okay? And so here, when we get to Romans chapter 10, Paul says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And you have to ask yourself, saved from what? But you don't have to go far to understand what he's asking that they would be saved from. He says in verse 2, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. Now notice that he doesn't say that they have just a zeal, but I think the Holy Spirit goes out of its way there to say they have a zeal of God. It's from God and it's for God. He says they have a zeal that is from God. They have a zeal that is for God, but he says it's not according to knowledge see what he's saying is that their zeal is not based on truth you ever known people that are very zealous but it's they, they're not it's not based on the truth of the gospel so you say is this relevant to us today this is relevant to us today <laughs> he says my prayer for israel is they might be saved for i bear them record they have a zeal of god but not according to knowledge for they being ignorant of God's righteousness. He says, and going about to establish their own righteousness. He says, here's a group of people that are going about, they're living their daily lives from the time they wake up till they go to bed. When they think about their relationship with God, they are trying to establish their own righteousness before God. And he says, they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. 
Then in verse 4, he says, for Christ, listen y'all, Christ is the end of the law. The law is working things out, right? Trying to work for your salvation, trying to merit your salvation, trying to keep the commandments, trying to keep the laws. And he says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. So we learn from these first four verses of Romans 10 that the problem with these people, the problem for Israel is that they were not truly believing that Christ was enough. They had not submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. And what is the righteousness of God? It is Christ, right? He says they, that, that Christ is the end of the law. He's the end. He's saying when you see Christ as being enough, that's the end of you having to do anything else to merit your salvation or to earn your righteousness. We sang as our transitional hymn this morning, Lord in thy presence. You remember what it says? It says, Lord, in thy presence, here we meet. May we in thee be found. I love you all. Aren't you glad it doesn't say, may we in Josh be found? You'd be out of luck, wouldn't it? Brother Hugh, I love Brother Hugh. I don't want you to represent me before God. Because the truth is, we will never be enough, never, ever, 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 ever be enough to stand before a holy God. Our only hope for righteousness is found in Christ. In Christ. In Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2, you read a lot about being in Christ. In Christ, in Christ. I won't turn there. We won't look at those this morning. What does it mean to be in Christ? I believe to be in Christ is to mean that you have such a union with Christ that what is His is yours and what He did is is credited to you as if you did it. You are represented by Him. And so, what the husband and the wife were doing in Genesis chapter 3 is... They were faced with looking at what they did and and having to think that now I stand in the presence of God and God sees me for what I did. And, And the result of that is they wanted to hide their sin, right? Try to do something to get away from that. But the truth is, if you're in Christ... God does not look at you as if it's what Gavin did. God looks at Gavin based upon what Christ did. God doesn't look at you as the one who said that thing you shouldn't have said. I I won't go into the list of the things we could have done. We'd be here forever, right? God doesn't look at you as the one who didn't get it together. God looks at you and He sees His Son. And when God wanted people to know what He saw in His Son, He bellowed out a voice from heaven that said, this is My beloved Son in whom, listen to what He says, in whom I am well pleased. So when Christ, when, when, when God the Father looks at Christ, this should, this should be, we all understand this. When, when God looks at Christ, do you think He sees anything lacking in Christ? No. Do you think God the Father would have let Christ back into His perfect heaven if Christ would have failed to do what He came to, to earth to do? But now He's seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, because God is well pleased with Christ. And you know, God knows everything from the end to the beginning. And God knew, see, that was when Christ had started his earthly ministry. He'd been baptized. He comes up out of the water. The spirit descends and a voice from heaven comes down and says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And God knew three and a half years later what Christ was going to do and what Christ was going to accomplish and whether or not he would get it done, 
He knew it that day. He didn't have to wait. (laughs) And he said, this is the one in whom I am well pleased. Because this is the one that will secure salvation. This is the one. So our only hope to stand in the presence of God, whether it be in heaven or whether it be right now, to stand in the presence of God and for God to accept us is that we be found in Christ. And in case you get to thinking, well, how do I get in Christ? Paul told the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30, he says of him, are you in Christ? <laughs> so if you ever get the idea that I'm not, i got to do something to get in Christ, Paul blows that one up in verse 30 of 1 Corinthians 1. He says of God, are you in Christ? <laughs> it is God that placed you in Christ. What did, what did God do for those who are in Christ? I want to read this. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We we read about the great exchange that took place on the cross of Calvary. He says of the same one that that it's, it's of him that you're in Christ, that is of God the Father that placed you in Christ. He says, for he, speaking of God the Father again, hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin. All of us have known sin. Listen, you know, the Bible says that there is pleasure in sin for a season. And every one of us in this room has had the benefit of experiencing that pleasure for a little while. But yet we will never pay the penalty for the pleasure we gained. Because Christ didn't know sin. He never knew the pleasure of sin. But yet He took upon Himself the penalty that we deserved. Isn't that amazing? He says, For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. You say, how could I ever be righteous with God? Well, your your only hope is that you are in Christ. That's your only hope, isn't it? Do y'all want more of a hope? You say, I want something more than that. What more could you want than to be in Christ? (laughs) I want to read these these verses to you from from In Christ Alone. Listen to this this wonderful hymn. In Christ alone, my hope is found. How many of us can really say that? In Christ alone, my hope is found. You know what that means? I'm not looking to my performance to find my hope. A lot of us understand that Christ was the propitiation for our sins when we think about doctrinally, but experimentally, in experience, we don't look to Christ for our hope. We look to our own performance. Listen, in pulpits across America today, there are preachers that are telling you to look to your performance to see if you're in Christ. There are preachers that are saying, if you want to be in Christ, you need to do this, you need to do that. And I can tell you, if you you check off all the boxes that they give you at the end of the day, when you're by yourself, you're still going to feel like you don't measure up. And the hymn writer says, in Christ alone, my hope is found. It says, He is my light, my strength, my soul. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. There is no other foundation than Christ. He says, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. The next verse says, in Christ alone who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, listen to this, scorned by the one's He came to save. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on Him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live. That's what what 2 Corinthians 5.21 is all about. In the death of Christ, we live. The great exchange. And so if you're looking today at anything outside of Christ as your hope of being in Christ, if you're looking at anything outside of that, you're sowing fig leaves and hiding in the trees. 
And you'll never feel the guilt removed from your conscience. I want to go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, Paul says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, and beware of the concision. He kind of slurs the circumcision there. He, he's saying these dogs, these evil workers, and these the, the people that he's saying, the concision, this faction, these are people who are teaching that Christ wasn't enough. Christ did his part. You still got to do yours. We'll summarize that. That's what they're teaching. He says in verse 3, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus, key point here, and have no confidence in the flesh. He says no confidence in human effort, no confidence in anything outside of Christ. None. Though, now listen to what he says. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any man thinks... See, there was these people teaching that, that you, you, know, you had to keep the dietary laws or you had to keep the, the right of circumcision or you had to keep this or you had to do this. And it doesn't matter what you add to what Christ did. If you add anything else, the devil's going to rob you of your security in your mind. All right? And so these, these, these Pharisees are teaching, you got to do this, you got to do that. And now Paul, who has left all that behind, is going to remind them, I was the big man on campus when I was a Pharisee. <laughs> if you think you've got it together, I had it even more. <laughs> he says, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other thinks that he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He, he, says, he says, I was so zealous for the law, which the law represents really here working your way to God's presence or to God's favor. He says, I was so zealous of that that when this new faction came about that was saying Christ did it all and it was all by grace, I wanted to kill him. Okay, he says, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. <laughs> he is saying, now listen, he's saying this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now he was not perfect, but he's saying, he's basically saying, I kept the law better than, nobody else was going to come to Paul and say, I've kept the law better than you did. He was committed. He says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. What was the problem with those of Israel in Romans 10 for whom he was praying? They had a zeal of God, but it wasn't according to knowledge. And now... Paul is saying, I found the truth and I will give up everything to press into the truth. How many of y'all are willing to give up something for the truth? He says, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb that I may win Christ. Verse 9, he says, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. He goes on to say that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. He says, I want to be found, verse 9, in Him. He, Paul's not saying that I want to I want to live my life in such a way that I will work my way into Him. He's saying when I look at my life, I want to see myself as being in Him. Okay? Paul knew that he couldn't get himself. Paul's the one that wrote to the Corinthians that it's God the Father that puts you in Christ. 
So now he's saying, by experience, I want to, I, I don't want to ever think about the fact that I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was named after the first king of Israel. My, I was, I was the, I was the a Pharisee. I had it together concerning the law. I was blameless. I did it all right. He says, I don't look to any of that when I want to feel peace with God. He says, I simply want to be found in Christ, not having my own righteousness. He says, I don't look to what Christ did plus what I did. That's what he's saying. He says, I want to look to Christ for righteousness. He says, see, he says that's of the law. And, and listen, even if it's not the Ten Commandments, but it's a commandment of man that says you've got to do this to get right with Christ. He says that any of that righteousness is law righteousness and law righteousness will just get you until you're in a quiet place alone and then you won't feel secure in your salvation anymore. But here we've got heavenly righteousness. He says that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I want to read to you from Brother Harold Hunt. When he speaks on this verse, he says, but that which is through the faith of Christ, he says the faith which lays claim on the righteousness of Christ has Christ both as its object and as its source. It has Christ as its source in that unless He gives us faith, we will never have it. And it is Christ as its object in that our faith is directed toward Him. Paul had lost all confidence in himself and in his own merit to justify himself before God, and his sole confidence was in the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. So here's what I'll close with. Christ is enough. Do y'all agree with that today? Christ is enough. And if you have a desire to follow Him and love Him today, I'm going to tell you, you're in Him. Because only those that are in Him have a desire to even follow Him or love Him or try to please Him. And you don't have to cower in fear before His presence. And, and you don't have to so fig. Aren't y'all so glad you don't have to cover your shame? And you don't, have to hide, you don't have to hide from the presence of God. Matter of fact, because of our high priest, it says we can boldly come to the throne of grace. You can boldly come into the presence of God. Not based on what you've done, but based upon what Christ has done. And so my prayer for all of us today is that we would experience the forgiveness that we have. Because I'm telling you, there's millions upon millions of God's people that have forgiveness, but they hadn't tapped into it. They haven't, exper they haven't experienced justification by faith. What is justification by faith? It is simply you experiencing justification in your own mind and consciousness. That is justification by faith. I want to I read this, and then we'll finish. Back to Brother Harold Hunt. He wrote this. The only righteousness we have is that righteousness which is of God. That righteousness which He has by grace imputed to us. And it is by faith we lay hold on it and claim it as our own by faith. The only way that we'll ever experience standing in the presence of God and feeling unashamed is when our faith is in what Christ did on that cross. That's the only way. If you look to anything outside of that, you will never feel free in the presence of God and you will ne never feel forgiven of your sins. And I'm going to tell you, when you experience that peace, that's a good place to be, isn't it? It's a good place to be. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for this day. Thank You for the blessings of this church. Thank You for Jesus Christ and sending Him to secure our salvation on the cross of Calvary. And may we, as Paul, not look to our righteousness because we know that our righteousness is plural. Everyone we've got is just filthy rags before You. So why would we bring our rags, our filthy rags before the throne of God when we can bring the pureness that was imputed to us through Christ? May we in our own minds, in our own consciousness, understand that we're in Christ and God looks at us today as He did Christ and He says, that's my beloved son, that's my beloved daughter, and I am well pleased in her and I am well pleased in Him. Help us to understand that, Lord, because many of us struggle
to comprehend. Many of us struggle to truly believe that Christ was enough. May we by faith enter into the grace wherein we stand and feel the forgiveness that the Apostle Paul felt and that many others. The, 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 the shackles, may they be released and may we live in freedom that we can stand today free and unashamed. Naked and open in front of your eyes. Nothing hiding us. No fig leaves. No, no hiding spots. But open in front of you and yet free. Thank You, Lord, for Jesus Christ who secured that for us. May You open doors in Birmingham, Alabama that other people who feel shame, who do not seek You because they feel that they're not enough, may they understand that Christ was enough for them too. That they can come together and we can sing praises that will be accepted because He doesn't look at it as as us singing, but as Christ singing. (laughs) He doesn't look at our prayers through the lips of sinful, sinful people, but they they go through the, the filter of Christ's blood. May we understand the power that we have through Christ, the forgiveness we have through Christ, the salvation that we have through Christ, and may that free us from the bondage of the shame of sin. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, We'll stand and sing a hymn at this time. There's any that wants to unite with our church, come forward and, and let your desire be known. Brother Joshua, can we sing number two from the Songs of Zion?